Blade Runner 2049. There have been many things said about this movie. Good, bad, been reviews saying it's boring, been reviews saying it's great. But if I had to describe this movie, it'd be deep and saddening. The difference between this movie compared to others is that the main protagonist, K, isn't somebody special. He's a normal person, just like me and you. We have gotten used to these movies where we always just see the special ones. Avengers, you know, Interstellar, all these movies. It's always on that one person that's so special. But what about everyone else? I've been wanting to make this video for so long. It's been in my mind forever. I've just been waiting to do it right and learn how to edit more so that I can make this perfect thing. I want to do it right because of how much this movie means to me. This movie is one of the first movies I spent days studying and really got into filmmaking and stuff like that. And every time I watch a movie or I do a deep dive into something pertaining to the first or second Blade Runner films, there's always something new to find. If you look at Blade Runner 2049 through a hollow lens, or face value many would say, people would say it's boring just like the first one. But what about what's behind the face? If you peel back a layer, if you start looking at what maybe they're hinting at, what themes are they showing you? What are they hinting at in dialogue? In the first Blade Runner, the main theme, I would say, is what makes us human. This is something you have to know before going in and seeing 2049. You have to have seen the first Blade Runner. So it begs the question, what makes us human? Is it bleeding? Is it the value of life? The first Blade Runner really does leave it up to you to decide what you believe makes people human. So to understand 2049, we have to talk about the first movie. The first movie is very, very, very sci-fi, directed by Ridley Scott, you know, Alien, stuff like that. And it you could classify Blade Runner as a cyberpunk kind of film noir movie. Harrison Ford plays Deckard, and he is ordered to kill I think six replicants and the reason why he wants to do it is because he wants to buy an animal right animals are a commodity in this world they are so expensive and they everyone looks for these animals they want this so he finds some replicants or whatever and he finds his eventual love interest and he kind of fights with himself about how can he be in love with something that was made from in, in a sense like it's ba it's kind of like a robot right it's made by tyrell company and stuff like that so he fights with himself through the whole movie about this and does he really love someone and does you know um she really love him back the main i guess antagonist is roy and rest in peace the actor i think um he just died rupert was his name uh i think a week ago roy is a replicant that um, deckard's chasing throughout the whole movie and throughout the whole time you see roy living his best life right replicants are slaves right they go off to these worlds and do bad work and you know they're like i said they're basically slaves so now he's running through the city living his best life he's having the most fun and with deckard he's not having fun he's having to kill replicants one of the main things that people come out of the first blade runner and the questions they ask are well the main question is is Deckard a replicant? And I don't think that's the right question to ask. I think the right question to ask is, is Roy human? Did he achieve what you believe to be human? Is it preserving life? Is it bleeding? Is it just emotions? They have emotions, right? So let's talk about the ending of the first Blade Runner because it is so huge for this film and it is one of the best endings in filmmaking history. If you haven't seen the Blade Runner ending. I'm going to show it in a few minutes. Just I'm going to show the full thing just so you can see how great that ending is and what kind of impact it has on uh, the sequel 2049. So I'll go ahead and explain the scene. At the end of the first Blade Runner, the replicant named Roy can let Deckard die. Deckard's hanging off a building. He can let him fall, but he doesn't. He pulls him up and sits down and he says what could possibly be one of the best monologues ever given in a movie. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. 
Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten House Gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like <clears throat> tears. You can interpret the final scene the way you want, but I take it as he could have taken Deckard's life, but he saves it, he preserves it, and that is what makes him human. Not bleeding, not emotion, not feeling anything, but preserving life. And I think it showed Deckard as well that replicants are human. They're able to to preserve life there's no and the replicants aren't like androids right they're not robotic inside they're us so this goes into 2049 so i'll, I'll give a rundown of the movie i'm not going to do the movie justice with how i do this i'm just going to kind of hit the big points for the plot and we'll move on so k played by ryan gosling is a blade runner ordered to hunt replicants the movie starts by him killing an old replicant he then walks outside and sees a tree with a marking on it. Fast forward a little bit, they eventually dig up underneath the tree and they discover bones in a box. They then discover that it was a replicant's bones, but that the replicant died from having a kid, which replicants can't do. It, it's the first time in history a replicant's had a child. It's huge. The, the basic point is replicants creating life would make them human, right? So fast forward and he discovers, um, when he goes back to the house where he kills the first replicant, a horse with a date on the bottom. Um, he ha He's always had memories of running through a factory as a kid having the horse that he found. He then goes to Dr. Anna who creates memories for replicants, right? So she creates these fake things that they always install in the replicants. Um, and she has a machine that can see if memories are real or not. So he sits down and she sees what he sees and starts to cry. She tells him that the memories are real. Kay freaks out because he thinks he is a, a real human. He's the special replicant, right? Uh, I'll go ahead and show the scene right here. I know it's real. This movie builds up the fact that Kay is the chosen one. We all believe he is the chosen one until some things happen. And at the end, he's with his group and they reveal it was a girl. You imagined it was you. We all wish it was us. That's the chosen one. And the memories Kay has were implanted in him like a normal replicant. He then has to sit there and come to grip that he's no one special. And that says a lot for a movie. A movie, like, when you watch The Avengers, you're watching that movie because those are special people you're watching, right? Iron Man, Spider-Man, they are special. But in this case, not special. He's a replicant that barely shows emotion, but you feel for him. So eventually, he has to go and rescue Deckard and take him to his daughter. So the movie ends with Deckard meeting his daughter. The way I went through that, it does the movie disservice. There's so much more that I just either forgot or just don't have in my script. But this, the story itself is phenomenal. So let's talk about something more than just the story. It's the hidden themes that most people wouldn't pick up. So let's talk about his fake girlfriend named Joy. Bon appétit. 
I missed you, baby sweet. Honey, it's beautiful. Just put your feet up. Relax. It was a day. Hmm? It was a day. Would you read to me? It'll make you feel better. You hate that book. I don't want to read either. Joy is an AI who was programmed to love Kay. Whatever he wants, she will do. In the first scene, you meet her, she's able to change her appearance and everything like that and be the perfect girl for Kay. She even says, read me a book. And he goes, you know, you don't like that book. He's telling her she doesn't like it. And she's like, yeah, I don't like that book. We don't have to read it anyways. The scenes between Kay and Joy are so great because they both experience the same thing. Are they real? Are they a real human? Joy says a lot that she wants to be a real girl and that Kay wants a real girl. Of course, Kay denies this. And the theme is that he loves her because she is real to him. It brings up the question that even though she was made 4K, is the love for him real? Do you still accept that love? Personally, I think the relationship you build between is true, is real. I mean, she has her own thoughts and stuff like that. She could say no. I mean, she's programmed to love you, but like, I don't know, to me, I feel it's wholesome. There's also a really cool sex scene that I'm not gonna show you, um, obviously, but you must see it. it it's different she ended up dying stop i do hope you're satisfied with our product i love you and later in the film um so Kay gets this stick that he can so the way when you first see her she's stuck in this little she's stuck in his apartment right there's this little projector screen thing and she can't move she can't experience anything so he buys her a gift and it's this thing to where he can take her wherever he goes i think that shows a lot too of he likes her so much and he wants somebody to be around so much that he's willing to pay probably a high premium to carry her around the next scene that happens is he takes her outside when it's raining And it, it, it's such a beautiful scene of her looking around and sticking her hand up. And even though she can't feel the rain, like it still just impacts you so much. And they share a kiss. And it's really weird because she's not, he doesn't feel anything, you know? And like he doesn't feel the kiss. And then halfway through the kiss, he gets a text message or whatever and she freezes. That's just how that works, right? So she ends up dying. And this is to me the first time Kay 
experiences real emotion and death in his life. I think what also makes us human is not just preserving life, but it is death. We all experience death, right? Whether it's a family member, a friend, we all experience it. So that, that's the main points from the movie that I want to talk about when it comes to themes and the story. The next thing I want to move to is the lighting, the music, just the way it's shot. It's amazing. The way the city is laid out is amazing. It feels real. It feels like a real world. Everything's tight. Everything. There's a great shot at the beginning of the, the film where Kay's flying back to LA and all you see is just like this black mass, but you can see lights in between like the streets. It's all so congested and it's always dark. It's always dark. The city provokes interesting ideas. There's ads in the city that can come up and talk to you. Could you imagine if you're walking down and there was a, a Klondike bar ad walking up to you and actually asking you, what would you do? And then it's reacting to whatever you're saying, right? The city's always dark, like I said, but it's bright with billboard signs. It's everywhere. Ads are everywhere. It's always the idea of, is this our future? Is everything going to have an ad in it, right? I mean, we're already kind of at that, but it could be worse. The lighting is amazing in this movie. There's so many things when it comes to... Um, you could talk about when he goes to a place in Las Vegas... It's all orange. Everything's orange. And it's this really nice contrast. You just went from dark to the scene that's, I mean, it's brighter, but you're not in light often. Like it's not daytime often in the movie. And I think it, it shows certain key points in the story when it's bright, like in the beginning of the film, it's bright because he's, you're seeing him kill his replicant that he's um, been assigned to kill. And then he finds the box with the bones. The next time it's bright, is when he finds Deckard. And then the last time it's bright is the final scene in the movie, which we'll talk about later. So those three big points in the movie, they're the brightest, right? I want to talk about my favorite scene. And I call it Seawall, because in the soundtrack, there's a thing called Seawall where this whole fight happens. It's the climax of the story. It's when Kay's fighting one of the main protagonists, or antagonists, sorry. <laughs> great about it is they're at the edge um, of the ocean but there's this huge wall behind them right and water splashing up everywhere and what's great about the scene and why I love it so much is the only source of light in the whole scene is from the car from inside a car and it's so beautiful but you just look at how different that is you don't see that often when it comes to an action scene and it has to be filmed just right because if a scene's too dark, you don't know what's going on, right? You're gonna be confused on what's happening, but they film it so perfectly. So one of the last things I wanna talk about is the music. So Hans Zimmer, and I think I think it's Benjamin Wolffish. It, it's some of their best work. I'll let you listen to my favorite track in the whole movie, it's called Mesa. It, it's so, be it's a certain section, it's about 45 seconds in. Um, I've probably been having it played out through the whole video, but it, it's so beautiful. So here, I'm gonna raise the volume and just let you listen. It's so beautiful. All the songs, even the ones that are more energetic or ones that use in action scenes um, are great. It, it's some of the it's some of the best music work I've ever heard. It's used per I can't criticize anything music wise with this movie. Nothing's annoying. Everything works. Seriously, go listen to the soundtrack. You will not be disappointed. Mesa, Tears in the Rain, all those are just phenomenal. They use the music very well to set up tones for upcoming scenes. Joy's track 
which is the name of it on the soundtrack, is lighthearted because that's what her character is. And her scenes are very lighthearted. It's always talking about love. She always calls him, Joe, you're the chosen one. I knew you were special. The track Seawall is very brash and louder than normal because that's where the big fight happens and Tears in the Rain at the end ties it back to the first movie so well and it's impressive. That one song can relay the same themes from a scene over 30 years ago. It's truly special. Like I said earlier, when that plays, when Kay is dying, you realize that him and Roy are very similar and they did everything to show that they are human or to feel human. Roy and Kay are very similar in ways that I've been recently noticing and I really looked into the connections. They're both not special. They both helped Deckard in ways that he could never thank him enough for. And Roy, even though he saved Deckard, like they both preserved his life. They both went and saved him. They wanted him to live to for whatever reasons, right? I mean, obviously Kay wanted him to live to see his daughter. Like that was his mission. The movie is a true sequel, has a story to tell and that needs to be told. It's not something that's being made just because kind of like what Toy Story 4 was or I, I don't know um, kind of the Jurassic World and all these big blockbusters they're just being made to make money they're not being made for a reason finally I want to talk about the final scene Kay takes Deckard to his daughter who's Dr. Anna Deckard walks inside Kay stays outside and sits on the steps the scene is very bright it's very happy in a sense I mean he's dying but it's snowing and then all of a sudden one of the best songs in a sci-fi movie Tears in the Rain starts playing Kay at this moment becomes human, just like Roy. They both preserved and saved life. They both did something for Deckard. They're continuing the replicant's evolution into all of them being humans, right? They, they just prove that replicants can have a kid creating life. And so Kay's purpose, at the end, he does become special because without him, that would not have happened. Kay lays on the steps and dies. It's one of the most emotional scenes I've seen in a long time. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I get my point across with this movie about why it's so special. You really have to go and watch it. It, it. It's too hard to explain in one video. I might in the future do some things just focusing on certain aspects of the movie, like maybe a video just on joy and their relationship and what I think of that. There's just so much to go through, but these are kind of the big points that when I think of this movie, makes me love it so much. I don't know if I got my point across as well, just because this is my first time doing like a in-depth look at a movie like this and putting it out there i've always had my own thoughts but i feel that people think that if a movie doesn't do well at the box office that it is trash that's not the case 2049 is is not only the best movie to come out in the past 20 years but you can make the case that it is the best sequel and movie of all time this is my favorite movie i've ever watched and hopefully by you watching this you will maybe take a look at the first movie or the second one just be intrigued just go just one night get all your friends and sit down and just experience these films sometimes you have to look beyond the face value of something to get the true story and that's where blade runner 2049 shines i will never forget this memory i will never forget this movie and the inspiration it has given me so make sure to like comment subscribe if you want more of these kind of videos let me know just comment down below go to my social so thank you for watching all those moments will be lost in time like